This is an interview with Dr. Robert Bielan, who was the Peace Corps doctor in the Dominican Republic at the time of the 1965 Dominican Revolution and United States intervention. It's worth saying that Senator Richard Russell uh, was the head of the Armed Services Committee during that time. W. Tapley Bennett, another Georgian, was the American ambassador in the Dominican Republic. And Dean Rusk, uh, also from Georgia, was the American Secretary of State. My name is Howard J. Wiarda, and I am the Dean Rusk Professor of International Relations at the University of Georgia. Uh, so Dr. Bielan has come here from California, has donated uh, his papers and photos and books uh, and reminiscences of the Dominican Republic uh, from his time as the Peace Corps doctor there in the mid-1960s. The Dominican Republic Revolution in 1965 was tremendously controversial, and a lot of us thought it was really the prelude to the even larger American intervention in Vietnam uh, that began in the mid-1960s, that everything that happened in Vietnam um, had, its, had its prelude, uh, its preface, really, in the Dominican Republic, including uh, over a period of time, the discrediting of uh, Lyndon Johnson as president and the beginning of the end of the Great Society. So this was an important event, almost completely forgotten by American historians and foreign policy analysts. So we're very happy to have Dr. Bielan uh, here to talk about it. Could you please give us a little sense of your own background, where you were born and where you grew up? and? Was this a happy experience? Well, I, <clears throat> I'm i uh, a native of uh, northeastern New Jersey, about 15 miles from New York City, in a community called Garfield, New Jersey. And I <clears throat> received my uh, elementary school and high school um, education at that uh, location. And then I uh, did my undergraduate work at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. uh, after uh, completing my undergraduate work, I then uh, <clears throat> was accepted at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and uh, spent four years uh, at uh, Penn uh, Med Medicine, <clears throat> following which I uh, did a one-year internship at Bellevue Hospital in New York. And upon completion of that one year internship, uh, I uh, knew that I was uh, about to be drafted as the physician draft was still in effect at that time. <clears throat> and I was also planning to get married. In an attempt to find a place where I uh, could spend my military time and have my wife accompany me, I began calling the various services. And they said, well, uh, you can spend two years without your wife, or if you bring your wife, you will spend three years. Well, it was my intention <laughs> to continue my medical education and become an orthopedic surgeon. And that was an additional four years before I would really get out to uh, working and so I thought, well, and one more year would really um, not sit well. I was get, getting older, and it was time to, to uh, move along. A friend of mine uh, told me of the uh, position of a Peace Corps physician. Uh, apparently... Kennedy, in his desire to, to have young people uh, join the Peace Corps, was contacted by parents of many of them, and, <clears throat> the, and their concern was, well, if my child goes over to Africa, what will we do for medical care? So uh, a, an, a, an arrangement was made with the United States Public Health Service to provide physicians for the care of Peace Corps volunteers. Mm 
And along with uh, providing the physicians, I, you know, I learned also that if I were to be one of the Peace Corps physicians, I could take my wife and uh, the time period would be two years of service rather than three. So that, that appealed to me. Now, I have to admit that I was not um, influenced greatly by Kennedy's uh, speech to say, um, ask not what you, uh, or ask not of what you, what is it? Ask not what you. Um, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask, ask what you can, you can do, do for, for your, your country. country. Yeah. That, that, that was not my, uh, my inspiration. Right. Uh, but uh, the, I did um, uh, join the Peace Corps at that, at that time. As a doctor. As a doctor. Yeah, you already had your, your MD degree at yes, that I, time. Yes, I did. And what, what year did you receive your MD? 1962. Okay. So you're a couple years older than I am, but not by very much. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was thinking that um, the arrangement was that you could serve a residency and get your residency out of the way by serving with the Peace Corps for a certain number of years. But that sounds like that's a mistaken notion. In other words, that your, your motives and intentions were different than that. You already had an internship, it sounds like. Yes, I did. And um, I spent my two years to satisfy my military obligation but it did not contribute to right. any form of residency. I see, I see, so. okay. Now, did, uh, Dr. Bielan, did you have any training in tropical medicine before you went down there? There was a, a period of time uh, in early July of 1963 when a group of, um, of Peace Corps physicians about to uh, depart to various parts of the world uh, had some introductory lectures uh, in Washington, D.C. And I think I had uh, perhaps an afternoon of uh, tropical diseases, uh, exposure okay. to tropical diseases, yeah. and that was about the extent of it. All right. Oh, that's interesting. My son is an MD. Uh, he likes to say that he's a real, M a real doctor as compared with his father, who only has a, has a doctorate in political science. But he got training at Tulane, in tropical medicine. And there aren't very many places in this country, at least in, in the 60s. Uh, I think probably immigration has now changed that, right? Because we get a lot of people out of the Caribbean and Central America who come to this country with tropical illnesses of one sort or another. But in those days, there were very few places that taught tropical medicine. And my son did some work on that at Tulane but then never followed it up. He ended up with a different specialization. I say that because so many of your patients are going to have tropical diseases, are they not? Intestinal diseases and stomach diseases and food poisoning. And that was the uh, primary focus of the, the practice that I had there. Right. I, was, <clears throat> uh, I was given the, the uh, requirement to, to care for um, diarrhea of very many forms and <clears throat> um, some of which um, have subsequently been recognized as uh, uh, diseases, whereas at that time it was just simply oh, another case of, of uh, GI upset. All right. So you arrived in the Dominican Republic when? In August of 1963. Okay. And um, in 1963, in August, Juan Bosch was the elected president of the Dominican Republic after 31 years of dictatorship of Rafael Trujillo. And then a month after Bosch arrived, he was, uh, after you arrived, Bosch was overthrown in a military coup d'etat. Tell us where you were and what your experience was. Right? I remember it specifically. Uh, at that time, uh, we were lodged in the Hotel Haragua, uh, looking for an apartment uh, in which we might be able to move. But uh, apartments were hard to come by. Right. So <clears throat> we were in the Haragua. 
and um, there was a, a sense of something has happened, and uh, people were talking about an overthrow of the government, but uh, the only external event that, uh, that was apparent to us was that uh, there was a curfew and uh, people were off the streets at six o'clock at night. Uh, <clears throat> there was no indication of any violence or uh, protests. It just simply happened. And <clears throat> the next day we went to work and shortly thereafter it seemed like um, a new government was, was formed and the new government was functioning. And so uh, for the Peace Corps and for the work that I did, it was hardly a, uh, a disruption at all. Um, my understanding is that uh, the embassy was very upset and uh, the uh, American uh, aid program was temporarily stopped, yeah. but that didn't affect us uh, in the Peace Corps. So then you got an apartment I did get a, a tell us where that was and what was that like. <clears throat> we were fortunate in in getting an apartment. Um, a physician friend, a Dominican physician friend, had um, an in-law who owned the apartment building, and uh, we uh, were given a uh, uh, an invitation to be part of it. The apartment was located very close to the university and uh, actually it was on the corner of uh, Alma Mater and uh, Lope de Vega. A very pleasant apartment um, but uh, being that close to the university occasionally we were subjected to whiffs of tear gas uh, or um, uh, the presence of elite uh, police, de police group called the, the Cascos Blancos. Right. And they, they would occasionally march onto the campus and uh, I pre presume keep uh, protests under control. Yeah. Their way of keeping protests under control was to beat up the students, which they did regularly. <laughs> well, that may have been the case. Now you were how old at that time? In 1963, you would have been how old? In, 19, in 1963, I was um, 20, 27 years old. Uh -huh. So not much older than the students who were, who were being tear gassed right, right down the street. That's true. Yeah. Um, were, you the, were you the doctor for the embassy as well as for the Peace Corps? Officially, I was not the doctor for the embassy. However, the embassy uh, did call upon me on occasion or at least various people in the embassy would call upon me uh, on, on occasion uh, to uh, request some evaluation or request treatment. Um, and why they did, I, I can't really say, except that perhaps uh, some of them did not know the Dominican physicians very well, or some of them did not have faith in the Dominican physicians, or some of them may not have wanted other people to know uh, that uh, they were seeking medical care. Right. That didn't happen very often. And when did you meet Ambassador Bennett, our fellow Georgian? <clears throat> well, as I recall again, uh, Ambassador Bennett um, arrived in country, I think in 1964, mm -hmm. and there was a, there was a reception for uh, him to which um, the government uh, agencies were invited and I met him at uh, that reception. Right. And then what were your relations with the embassy itself or with embassy policy? Were you thought of um, as the doctor that treated people or were you also brought into embassy uh, senior staff meetings, for example? Did you attend the nine o'clock uh, Monday morning staff meeting, for example? No, uh, I was uh, never um, asked to attend that. The director of the Peace Corps, uh, who was Bob Satin, right. uh, I 
believe he attended those meetings. And then he would um, have our own Peace Corps meeting to which he would uh, contribute. <clears throat> so I was essentially not part of the functioning embassy and <clears throat> uh, until uh, the revolution took place. And then right. uh, that's a different uh, so, time. So just to provide a little background uh, here, uh, the coup d'etat against Juan Bosch took place in September of 1963. And then within a month, a new civilian triumvirate was formed to provide some civilian government. But the military and the police, it was often thought, remained the power behind the throne. So you had a shift from a democratically elected government to one that was somewhat more authoritarian. And people will probably disagree about the degree of authoritarianness. And then during the following year, 1964, just before the explosion, the revolution, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, Pressures began to build up in the Dominican Republic from the trade unions and the opposition political parties and the new peasant associations that had formed in the previous few years. Did you see some of that pressure begin to build up? I'd, I'd like to get at some of the antecedents of the, of the revolution. The uh, <coughs> volunteers would report on um, activities in their barrios and uh, the activities of the political parties. Now, the Peace Corps itself maintained that it was strictly an apolitical organization. So we would not really take part in any of these um, conversations uh, or protests or uh, organizations. Uh, other than just to simply be aware of what the people were saying, what the people in the barrios were saying right. and thinking and feeling. And <clears throat> prior to the revolution, there was uh, talk of bringing back Juan Bosch because the uh, general populace was discontent with uh, the, the, certainly the economic situation and, uh, and other ways in which they were affected. So this was uh, passed on to us uh, and the volunteers would talk about uh, these various um, currents that were taking place under the, under the uh, in a sense, uh, hidden beneath right. the surface. Right. And so <clears throat> we knew that there was talk about bringing back Juan Bosch. His political party, the PRD, Partido Re Revolucionario Dominicano, um, was still a strong party. And uh, although it, it was perhaps the focus of uh, some anti-party um, uh, activity in the government itself. But other than knowing uh, just that this discontent was beneath the surface, yeah. uh, it was not our uh, Yeah, our there job. was a, you know, the, the people that you're talking about, the people in the barrios, the poor people, the trade unionists, the peasants and so forth, these are the people who precisely would feel the police and military oppression, especially out there in the countryside but in the urban slums as well. So it's very, and the, and the Peace Corps kids were stationed in all of these neighborhoods and in these rural villages. So in a sense, they had firsthand information coming to them, which they then passed on to you, it, it sounds like. And then would you pass it on to higher ups in the embassy, to the political section or the CIA section within the embassy, for example? Not very often. <clears throat> um, we. We, well, it was hearsay, in effect. And so uh, we, we might talk about, well, there's a little talk of this, or uh, there's discontent that uh, the party, the, the PRD, may not be allowed to participate in the uh, elections that, mm -hmm. are, that were proposed for some time in 1965. 
but uh, it was it was certainly not uh, anything other than than hearsay at that yeah. time. Did you go out into the countryside also? Did I? Yes, I did. Uh, Use one of those blue Peace Corps jeeps to go around in the rural, <laughs> rural areas. I think I went to parts of the Dominican Republic that Dominicans had never gone to. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, because I used those same jeeps uh, to roam around the, the country. Um, do you think that that you came to know Ambassador Bennett well during his ambassadorship there? No, I, I can't say that uh, uh, I knew him very well. And I don't think anyone in the Peace Corps uh, organization knew him very well. I think that's we, right. We were, we were kind of a separate unit. And uh, while we were an American arm uh, of, right. of uh, the State Department, we really weren't uh, invited to participate in all of the embassy functions. Yeah. Let me run down just very briefly some of the, some of the names from those days from the embassy team and see if you still remember them. Do you remember a, a, a man by the name of Fred Summerford, who was the labor attaché? Does that ring any bells with you? Uh, it, it does ring a bell, and <clears throat> I think uh, Fred Summerford uh, died while he was, he was down there. Yeah. Uh, I was not involved in evaluating his death or any, anything to that effect, but, yeah. but a friend of mine was, and uh, he... Uh, he, as part of the, the um, what was his, his role? He was, he was simply a, um, worked in the, in the consul, consulate. No, he was the labor attaché. No, my friend was, ah. was uh, working in the consulate, and he was asked to uh, evaluate the, the death of uh, Fred Somerville. He was a very controversial figure while he was yes. there, and then he died under mysterious circumstances that I don't know if, ever, if they've ever been resolved. And Harlan uh, Bramble was the economics officer. I did not know him. No, no. And of course, Bob Satton was the head of the Peace Corps, and um, Arthur Bryski in the political section. Does that does that ring a bell with you? I remember interviewing him when I was there also. I believe I met him, but yeah. you know, I don't know very much about him. So in 1964, that's very interesting what you say, that the Peace Corps volunteers who are stationed all over the country are reporting to you about the troubles in the neighborhoods and in the rural areas. Uh, the Dominican Revolutionary Party, the PRD, which was a social democratic party, its, its leadership was either in exile by then um, or its members were being beaten up. Did, did you become aware of some of the military plots that were also underway during that period? No, I, I was not aware of that. The Peace Corps was not aware of that to the best of my knowledge. This, uh, when the military plots, uh, primarily the revolution, occurred, it came as a complete surprise to us. Well, I was there as a, as a graduate student, and my recollection is that there were about five or six plots going on all at the same time, which is not unusual in the Dominican <laughs> Republic. Everybody's plotting all of the time. And the embassy was aware of one or two of them, but not aware of the other three or four. And so, you know, the embassy was op operating to snuff out these plots that were going on, but they got two of them, but they missed the other, the other four <laughs> that were going on at the, at the same time. Um, Indeed, the embassy was caught by surprise when the revolution was, took place. Because, it was caught by surprise. Because the ambassador was here in Georgia. Correct. And, um, at the time. And, and many of the military were attending uh, some conference in Panama, my understanding of it. So you had this buildup of pressure internally in 1964, early 1965, a lot of corruption, a lot of police brutality. And then uh, the revolution broke out on April 24, 1965. Where were you and what are your recollections of that day? <clears throat> On that particular day, which was a Saturday, we were having a... Um, a meeting of uh, our Peace Corps staff. The Peace Corps staff consisted of a, a director, Bob Satin, mm -hmm. and then some associate directors. One 
one of which was Richard Maxfield, mm -hmm. another one was Steve Honore, another one was Roberta Warren, mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and myself. And uh, we were meeting in the Peace Corps office, which uh, was located across Avenida Independencia from the Haragua Hotel. This was Saturday afternoon. And <clears throat> suddenly, the uh, young man that was part watchman and also part janitor for the Peace Corps office uh, came running up the stairs saying, there's an overthrow of the government. And uh, we uh, were kind of taken back and uh, <clears throat> then thought about it for a while and said, oh, well, we lived through the overthrow in September of 1963, it'll probably be another one of those 24-hour uh, uh, curfews and then uh, on with the rest of our lives. But <clears throat> to uh, alert the Peace Corps volunteers, we began making phone calls to tell them, stay in place and wait until uh, you receive further information from us. And at that point, the meeting concluded, and we went to our hotels, apartments, homes, and so forth uh, to wait to see what was going to happen Saturday evening. Um, things seemed to be quiet Saturday evening, but on Sunday morning, uh, things began to get a little um, more uh, noisy. <coughs> I remember the noise as we were awakened from our sleep by a number of the motorcycles or, or motor scooters, I guess, that uh, you would call the Hondas. And uh, they were driving through the neighborhood, tapping out a rhythm with their horns uh, that uh, in effect was saying uh, either uh, down with the government or uh, Viva Juan Bosch. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this, this then was the start of Sunday. And, and I was planning to uh, go to Puerto Rico on Monday to visit a group of volunteers that were in training to come into the Dominican Republic sometime in June. Well, uh, I uh, realized then that possibly the airport would be closed and I would not be able to leave. So I just simply waited and uh, waited to hear any news of what might be happening. There was very little news from our director or from any of the associate directors. No one seemed to know exactly what was happening and where we were going and what we were doing. The, the number of Peace Corps volunteers had called the office and said, there was activity in their barrios. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> and as I interviewed uh, some of the volunteers for uh, purposes of accumulating my uh, remembrances of the revolution, some of the volunteers were told, do you have a gun? And if you don't have a gun, you can go down to Parque Independencia where they're giving out guns. I thought this was really kind of strange, and we certainly didn't encourage our volunteers to have any guns. And that <clears throat> was uh, the next uh, day after the, after the revolution had begun, and we um, had simply uh, hung in there. Uh, uh, you know, it's often said in Latin America that you should launch a revolution on weekends uh, because the American embassy personnel are always out on the golf course on Saturday and therefore <laughs> out of access of their telephones and their cable uh, system. So this is one that got launched on a weekend on Saturday and Sunday. And then on Monday, it suddenly began to appear as if the rebels, who were called constitutionalists because they were in favor of bringing back Juan Bosch, the overthrown leader, as constitutional president. On Monday, it appeared as if the rebels might actually emerge victorious in this revolt. Is that, is that correct? Was that your perception also? Yes. Yes, that was the perception in the barrios as well. 
is that uh, the government is going to be overthrown. Well, for that matter, uh, the president at that time, Donald Reed Cabral, did resign on um, the uh, on Radio Santo Domingo yeah. on Sunday morning, and <clears throat> Sunday afternoon, a, a group of constitutional um, politicians uh, assembled in the um, National Palace. And I well recall standing on the roof of the Peace Corps office watching uh, planes from the armed forces actually bombing the National Palace. And Dr. Bieland, this is a really important one. It was your impression that the embassy was caught unawares by this outbreak, that they knew things were going on. Um, there were different plots underway, but full-scale revolution, as this turned out to be, they weren't expecting. Is that right? I think that's very I true. Think, yeah. mm -hmm. <clears throat> that um, had they been expecting it, then they would have been able to, for example, advise our uh, director uh, as to uh, measures to take and so forth. But uh, he was able to gain, gain no information from the embassy. And so we were, we were all just waiting to hear what was going to happen. Uh, again, along the lines of start a revolution on the weekend, there are some of the military that had not gone to the, the meeting in Panama were dove hunting with some of the, the Dominican uh, army exactly. members. Right. So uh, completely unaware. You know, I might mention also um, that uh, Christopher Dodd, who would later become the elected senator from Connecticut and a power in the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate, was one of the Peace Corps volunteers during your period in the Dominican Republic. No. No, he came later. Oh, he came later. He came oh. later, yes. Okay. I was thinking he was in one of the groups that was there during the revolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then four days later, after the outbreak of the revolution on April 28, um, the American Marines landed in Santo Domingo because while the events that you were talking about were going on in Santo Domingo, in Washington there were emergency meetings between President Johnson and Dean Rusk, and um, as I understand it, Richard Russell, our senator, was also consulted as the chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Forces Committee, and um, Lyndon Johnson feared that this revolution was becoming a communist revolution, and so he authorized the Marines who were already on the ships offshore to land um, and intercede between the contending forces in the Dominican Republic. What, what was that like? Where were you when the first Marines landed in Santo Domingo? Well, the Marines arrived in various numbers. And the first was just a small group of about 20 Marines right. that came to defend the uh, U.S. Embassy. Uh, they put up a perimeter and uh, uh, I guess defend was perhaps not the correct word. The, the Embassy was not being attacked, but um, the, the fear was that the, that the Embassy might be. Mm -hmm. uh, with them uh, came um, Ambassador Bennett, and <clears throat> uh, at that point we were also, we, the Peace Corps staff, were advised to report to the embassy where we were to um, be uh, present and perhaps protected. So, so you were in the embassy at, at the time when the Marines, when that first contingent of Marines came in? Yes. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> I was in the embassy, and I actually I spent uh, perhaps the next five days in the embassy, actually leaving, uh, living in the embassy, not leaving uh, the embassy in, in the sense that uh, I didn't return to my residence. <laughs>
And was Mrs. Beelan with you also in the embassy? Mrs. Beelan was with me in the embassy. Um, the embassy telephone system broke down. Uh, the embassy local hired Dominican um, personnel did not come to work. So she manned the, um, the switchboard for the, for the embassy. And for some reason, the many lines that they had didn't uh, work. There was only one line that came in, and she would pick up the line and then have to uh, wander through the embassy finding <laughs> the person who was, who was being called. Right. And <clears throat> well remembers that um, she had to find the ambassador because President Johnson was on the line. And <clears throat> that, uh, so we were, we were uh, told to report to the embassy by the director of the Peace Corps. And um, besides um, Peggy and myself, the families of the other staff members also reported to the embassy. And uh, that included, I think, 11 children and um, uh, three additional wives. So. Now, it was reported that the first contingent of Marines camped out around the embassy pool. Uh, is that correct? And then where, where were you and Peggy staying while, uh, while this excitement was going on? <laughs> they may have, they may have uh, camped out around the embassy pool. I don't remember exactly where they, where they set up their, their camp. Mm -hmm. Mostly, they were uh, stationed at the, at the perimeter around the wall of the embassy. Right. Um, the families uh, lived in the uh, embassy um, residence, and we spent time in what appeared to be a large ballroom there uh, where we slept and, and ate and moved back and forth. <clears throat> now, during this period, um, between the outbreak of the revolution and then the, the first Marines coming in, and then in the following days also, there was a lot of shooting and violence in Santo Domingo. Were you called upon to treat combatants, I guess, I sh is that the right word to use in this, in this strife, on both sides or just on one side? Or you as a physician, how did, how did you operate during this period? Um, I was not uh, called upon to, to treat any of the combatants either the, the Dominican um, constitutionalists or the members of the, the, the junta, the, the group that uh, was in control. I did, however, <clears throat> have to treat one Marine that was shot uh, while on uh, patrol at the embassy. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, I simply stood by uh, hoping that uh, no one else would, would get shot because I had very little in the way of medical supplies. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things that I did also was that uh, <clears throat> I manned a, a uh, part-time, I, I manned an amateur radio station. The, the um, employees of the embassy and perhaps of uh, the, the uh, aid group brought their cars to the embassy lawn, and one of them had uh, a, 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 a ham radio station in it. And for some reason, the embassy could not communicate with the ships offshore, but this <laughs> amateur radio station could. And uh, we were asked to take turns listening to the station to report any messages that had come in or to give any messages out to, the, uh, to one of the ships where they were listening to this. Hmm. And so I, I sat in this uh, Chevrolet, Cor it was not a Corvette, it was a uh, Corvair. <laughs> I sat in this Corvair and, and listened to the communications from the ships and carried on communications from the, from the embassy. Uh, <clears throat> and then I was always asked to, to stand by in case there had been 
any injuries or shootings of the, of, of the embassy personnel. But no one uh, called upon me uh -huh. other than that one Marine who had a relatively superficial wound. So did the armed forces coming in have their own physicians along or their own hospital or they set up a hospital camp or how did, how did it work for their own injured personnel? As they began to increase in numbers, uh, they brought in their own field hospital. And this was established at uh, the San Isidro Air Force Base where uh, the main headquarters for the Army was located. Mm -hmm. The Marines seemed to have their main headquarters around the Hotel Embajador. Right. And, <clears throat> and they had uh, the Boxer uh, aircraft carrier offshore and I assume that uh, it was the boxer that, that cared for any injuries that the Marines had. And what was happening to the Peace Corps kids uh, all during this period? Uh, both in the city where most of the fighting was and then out in the countryside, which I, I think was still relatively peaceful. The countryside remained relatively peaceful. Most of the, the volunteers remained at their place of... Uh, of work, their, their residence, and <clears throat> uh, did not uh, feel threatened in any way. The ones within the city uh, were under uh, assault in a sense mm -hmm. because some of them lived near the Radio Santo Domingo radio station and radio tower. And the the constitutional group had seized the, the radio and was using it to communicate to their people. And for this, uh, because of this, the um, armed forces were bombing and rocketing and, and shooting at the radio station and the radio tower. The volunteers living nearby had shells that fell on their, their residences and um, bullet holes in roofs and things of this nature. So the, initially the volunteers were told to stay in your neighborhood. You're probably safer in your neighborhood than anywhere else. But as things began to develop and uh, <clears throat> armed uh, battles began taking place, we began to get concerned as to what can we do with the volunteers to extricate them from this uh, dangerous situation. So ultimately it was decided that uh, perhaps it'd be safer for them to report to uh, some of the public hospitals in the area, thinking that the public hospital would be a little island of res uh, which would be respected by both the, the military and the uh, rebel groups. And so uh, they gradually made their way to the various hospitals. Moscoso Puello was one of the mm -hmm. hospitals. Padre Bellini was another hospital. And, uh, uh, and I can't recall the name of the third. Yeah. We had already had some nurses in the, the hospitals as part of a Peace Corps program. And so uh, the volunteers then joined the nurses in the hospitals doing um, whatever they could do um, without any medical training. Uh, that meant primarily uh, mopping floors, preparing food, uh, bringing water, and in some cases helping in the operating room as far as just holding lights, uh, holding flashlights, because uh, il the electricity would be unreliable. The hospitals had generators, but the generators would cut in and cut out, and so <coughs> uh, it, uh, they, they did an, any number of things, but the, the, we asked the volunteers to leave their various uh, uh, barrios and report to uh, the local hospital. Now this, this, this became, the role of the Peace Corps became very controversial uh, during this period because most of the Peace Corps volunteers living at grassroots level sided with the constitutionalists or the rebels or the pro-democratic forces 
and they were very critical of the military and of the police, and their perception often was that the embassy was on the wrong side in this revolution. So um, at first, if I remember correctly, and correct me if I go wrong here, um, the Peace Corps volunteers, as you suggested, were told to stay in place. Some of them then began talking to the journalists who were covering the revolution and saying very negative things about the American intervention. The American ambassador, Mr. Bennett, as well as Lyndon Johnson, was very angry with the Peace Corps uh, for subverting U.S. policy, um, swore a few times, as I recall, and then ordered the Peace Corps out of the country, ostensibly to, for their own safety and protection, but really for this political reason. So I hope you can shed some light on this very controversial episode. Yeah, I, I, would, I would correct one thing, and that is he did not order them out of the country. All right. But <clears throat> indeed, the rest of it is quite accurate. The volunteers were ultimately removed from the hospitals and taken to the hotel in Bahador mm -hmm. as a, the first uh, refuge for them. And many of the members of the press were also lodged in the in Bahador. Uh -huh. and, and at that time, <clears throat> the volunteers expressed their, their uh, displeasure with what the U.S. was doing because they felt that the, the people of the countryside were supportive of the constitutional group and that had the U.S. not sent in troops, the constitutionalists would have succeeded in their in their efforts to take over Santo Domingo and the government and, and, and the like, whereas uh, the presence of the U.S. troops uh, <clears throat> led to isolation of the, the constitutional groups to where they couldn't, uh, exactly. they, they yeah. couldn't uh, continue with their fighting. So uh, they spoke to the um, press at Hotel Embajador, and this made its way into the U.S. newspapers. This did not sit very well with the embassy, and uh, it, it, there was a time when Peace Corps volunteers and, and Peace Corps staff members were um, treated as if uh, they were not welcome yeah. in the embassy. Uh, <clears throat> ultimately, the Peace Corps volunteers did write a letter uh, protesting the um, intervention of the United States and, and listed a number of reasons why they were um, using this expression. And they intended to send it to President Johnson. Uh, it didn't make its way to President Johnson. It was interrupted uh, in, in the Peace Corps. Um, it was directed to Bill Moyers, who was uh, one of the the uh, higher-ups mm -hmm. in the Peace Corps. And immediately dispatched from Washington was the director of Latin American Peace Corps, who came to Santo Domingo, spoke to the volunteers and said, well, <clears throat> you may threaten, by, by your actions, you may threaten uh, the existence of the Peace Corps, not only in the Dominican Republic, but elsewhere. So this uh, is not going to be taken well in the White House. And so they um, backed off on their, their protest. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but then the group that had been involved in Santo Domingo was uh, invited to uh, a termination conference, which was due to occur sometime, I believe, in June or July. But the termination conference was moved up with the idea that they needed uh, some rest, that there was no point in continuing on because they couldn't get uh, back to their barrios and conduct uh, their activities in a safe manner. So uh, groups of volunteers were taken to um, San Juan, Puerto Rico, right. and uh, processed out of the Peace Corps. Uh huh. Okay. So then the nature of the mission changed over a period of time. Uh, I think 
I think most scholars think that Johnson intervened um, to prevent what he believed, and maybe Ambassador Bennett as well, might end up as a Castro-like communist revolution. And then the nature of the mission changed to more of peacekeeping and relief services, and eventually the Americans withdrew, um, for the most part, in 1966, the following, the following year. Were you there during that entire period, and, and did you witness this transition? In other words, the purpose of the intervention changed. I was not there uh, through the entire period. I left in June of 1965. Uh -huh. However, during that time, from when the revolution began to when I left in June of 1965, I uh, experienced and detected a change in the um, approach of the embassy. One of the things that the embassy did was to release a list of communists who uh, had been involved in the uh, start of the revolution. When the press got hold of this list, they investigated it and found that several of the names were for people who were out of the country, some were dead, some uh, were in, in prison, and so uh, the embassy list of uh, communist uh, uh, instigators uh, was discredited. And then the embassy seemed to make a, a little change, perhaps bit by bit, uh, uh, leaving their hard anti-communism uh, approach and uh, saying, well, this was a revolution that had a noble start, but uh, the communists uh, were uh, as, as communists do, they uh, infiltrated and began to take over, but subsequently uh, they have left as a, uh, perhaps as a result of our intervention. Yeah. Had Ambassador uh, Ellsworth Bunker was brought in as a peacekeeper, as a, as a way to build a new government after the overthrow and after what was really a civil war during this, during this period that you were there. Was he there already when you were, were there, or this was still the military phase of the intervention when you left in June? The, it was mostly the military phase. I believe that uh, he uh, came toward the end of my time there, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps sometime in June. There were earlier um, representatives uh, from uh, the State Department and, and the, uh, <coughs> the White House Thomas Mann and uh, uh, Jack Vaughn yeah. and uh, the, oh, I can't remember the names of the others, the, the Mac, Mac. Mac Bundy? Yes. Yeah, uh, was the national security advisor. I mean, today we would call that post-conflict reconstruction. And the Defense Department now actually has an office of post-conflict reconstruction, right? And this is 50 years ago we're talking about, <laughs> almost, right? The anniversary is next year of all of these events. So this is a wonderful time to have you here for this interview. Um, so we now have an office of post-conflict reconstruction, but this was a relatively new idea in 1965 that the Americans would intervene on one grounds of anti-communism and preventing a second Cuba, um, but eventually come around to a position where they did peacekeeping and democracy promotion and the reconstruction of a country which in some ways we had helped destroy. <laughs> it's rather like I, Iraq, I, isn't it? I, I think that's a, an apt yeah. description, yeah. Uh, actually. Uh, I was uh, asked to return to the Dominican Republic for a, a brief assignment of a week or so, which took place perhaps toward the end of 1965. And uh, my mission was to design programs in which they might use 1,000 Peace Corps volunteers. Well, the most we ever had in the country was about 130. So 
it took a great deal of uh, <laughs> imagination right. to try to uh, come up with a means of using 1,000 volunteers. But it is post, uh, um, post violence and time of reconstruction. As we, as we draw to a close here, um, what, what assessment have you reached now 50 years or actually 49 years later? Did the United States make a big mistake in intervening in the Dominican Republic to put down what it said was a communist revolution but really wasn't a communist revolution? Was this a, was this a prelude to Vietnam, do you think, in terms of American military interventions in the world? What's your assessment, uh, Dr. Bielan, after all of these years? I'd like to make it um, clear that I think absolutely the United States made a major uh, mistake when they intervened in the Dominican Republic. I think that um, many of the countries in Latin America have, uh, have ideas that uh, the United States will do it again and that uh, we're... <clears throat> um, a power nation uh, that uh, made, it, made a great error in Santo Domingo. Its relation to Vietnam, I really don't feel qualified to say, other than um, when I left the Dominican Republic, I was very doubtful of any uh, news releases, any, any uh, press conferences that were given by uh, U.S. Uh, um, State Department uh, members, and this colored my thinking about Vietnam, and I, I doubted uh, any of the uh, news that uh, came from our military uh, or uh, other uh, sources. Well, you know, if I can just add to that, because I was there during much of that same period that that you were there. Later on, I was able to interview some of the journalists who covered the Dominican Revolution and who had also interviewed Lyndon Johnson um, during this period and afterwards. And they told me that one of the motives was that uh, Lyndon jo for the intervention was that Lyndon Johnson wanted to send a message by sending troops to the Dominican Republic, he was sending a message to North Vietnam, Vietnam that you ought not to muck around in our American sphere of influence. And I guess I would say that obviously the North Vietnamese did not get the message. They didn't listen. They didn't <laughs> listen, did they? No. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Are there, are there some additional things that you'd like to add to this before we bring it to a close? I think we've covered it. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.